In these days of the novel coronavirus and social distancing, perhaps what I miss more than anything is human touch. How often I've wanted to give a hug and receive one. How many times have I reflexively put out my hand by way of a greeting, only to realize that the person I'm greeting really shouldn't reach forward and reciprocate? A while ago, we were doing elbow bumping and tapping feet, but now we can't even come that close together. Six feet is the absolute minimum distance of separation. People long to be at the bedside of their loved ones who are in hospital. They want to hold their hand and kiss their cheek, but they can't even be present in the room to offer the comfort that only touch can convey. I think all of us feel bereft, cut off by a virus that could be invisibly hovering in the air between us, or waiting to jump from one hand to the next, or float across the distance, borne on by the force of a sudden cough or an accidental sneeze. This acute sense of physical deprivation might help us to understand how Mary Magdalene felt on Easter morning when she first realized that it was Jesus who was actually standing before her. Not a gardener, not an angel, not an apparition, but her risen Lord, who, two days before, she had seen brutally crucified, murdered, and buried in a tomb. All hope of ever seeing, let alone touching, her Lord had vanished. So when she finally hears Jesus pronounce her name, Mary. Her vision, blurred by tears, at last clears, and she exclaims, Rabboni. Her first impulse is to fall to her knees and launch herself forward, throwing her arms around his legs, holding on to her beloved Lord in an embrace that she had thought utterly impossible up until that very second. But then, Jesus tells her that she must not go on clinging to him. In Greek, it's a present negative imperative, meaning she must stop doing something she has already started doing. She must stop hanging on to him. Imagine how she must have felt when she first heard those words. For a precious moment, she had thought that the past had been restored, that life with Jesus could now go on as before, because he had miraculously returned from the dead. It would be like Lazarus, whom Jesus had brought back from the dead and who continued now to live with his sisters Mary and Martha, just like before. That, I think, is the Mary we see in this painting by the Venetian artist Titian. She has embraced her Lord, but Jesus then steps away shielding himself from her touch. He does so with love, leaning over her protectively, and meeting her gaze with great love and tenderness, but keeping his distance. Her mouth is slightly open in surprise, her hand still raised in mute interrogation. What can this mean? The Lord telling her not to touch him. The Lord then goes on to explain what he means by the prohibition. First, he is going to be present for a while yet amongst his disciples. This will not be the only time she ever gets to see him again. As he says, I have not yet ascended to the Father. That will come later. For now, he will be in their midst bodily. But, secondly, Jesus is entering a new reality, and so must Mary. This will not be a continuation of what she had known before, but a completely new way of life when Jesus has ascended. And Mary's job now is to spread the news to the disciples and beyond. Jesus is not dead. He is forever alive and will soon be dwelling in glory with God the Father, both his Father and our Father, Jesus is God and our God and they will all be one in spirit. It seems to me that Titian captures this idea 
with the two intersecting diagonals or curves formed by Jesus's body curving toward the rolling hillsides. The graceful curve of his body is continued by the rising hills and continues on up to the rooftops and beyond. His curve intersects the curve formed by Mary's body bending towards him, while the line of her body is extended by the great tree in the background, going almost to the top of the painting. Jesus's life and Mary's will continue to intersect. Heaven and earth will come together, but in a new way, a way made possible by the death and resurrection of Christ. The new reality is dawning, as Titian conveys with the rising light in the east, the sun's beams just beginning to brighten the tops of the buildings on the hillside. But at this moment, Mary still reaches out, yearning for the reassurance that only a palpable, concrete touch can bring. And who cannot identify with that longing today as we shelter at home and practice social distancing? But there's another painting of this same scene that has made me focus on a different aspect of the Noli Matangere motif. It is by Fra Angelico, the 15th century Dominican monk who made paintings for each monk's cell in the monastery or convent at San Marco in Florence, as well as painting other scenes throughout the church and the convent. This is the painting for cell number one at San Marco, so it must carry a message that Fra Angelico and his patrons must have felt important beyond simply do not keep holding on to me. Mary leans forward with both arms open as Jesus gently steps away from her, his hand apparently signaling stop. Mary is radiant with light in sharp contrast to the darkness of the tomb behind her. She is opening herself as a flower does to the light and indeed as all the flowers in this lovely garden appear to be doing. But if we look closely, we see that these little red and white flowers look remarkably similar to the two wounds on Jesus' feet, as though his blood were making all nature spring up in newness of life. Looking even closer, just in front of Mary's bended knee and shin, we see a trinity of flowers which I have highlighted in yellow that are actually in the form of a cross. Jesus, dressed as in Titian's picture, as a gardener carrying a hoe or a spade, appears to be sowing the earth with seeds that have flowed from his own wounds, becoming beautiful flowers, a potential harvest of lovely blooms. And Mary is open to this bounty. She seems, with her open arms, to share in the spreading of it. And this carpet of flowers, I think, pertains to the second command that Jesus has for Mary. She is to be the apostle to the apostles, spreading the seeds of the good news that Jesus is alive, that a new life has begun, that Jesus will soon enter that new and eternal life with his Father, but it is a life we will share with him and his father forever. As we go through this COVID-19 time of testing, and heartache, a time of loss and isolation, it's heartening to see so many seeds of love and compassion being sown in communities throughout the land and certainly here at St. Mary's in Stewart. People are making up batches of delicious food, soup to give to our neighbors and to people we don't even know. People are making masks for those who are unable to find or make one themselves. Friends are calling friends they have seldom spoken with on the phone just to see if they're all right or if they need anything. Doctors, nurses, first responders, ambulance drivers, police officers, military personnel, grocery store clerks, people who work in drug stores and Walmarts, food banks, restaurants offering takeout service, 
The list goes on and on of people who are literally laying their lives on the line in order to make life possible and tolerable for the many people who are at risk and who depend on these, our heroes. Acts of kindness and compassion multiply, and the love of Christ is shed abroad just as the flowers that seemed to spring from Jesus' wounds. So for now, we cannot embrace one another. We cannot touch as we always have, and we miss that. It hurts. Yet, we are all touching and being touched in many ways we never imagined possible, and that may in fact go unseen, unrecognized. I just hope that when this time passes and we're able once again to hold one another and embrace, I hope we remember that during this perilous time, our lives were sustained by love, the kind of love that springs up out of wounds and gives us life.